good evening and welcome everyone uh, to the center for wildlife studies wildlife chronicles webinar on the occasion of the international tiger day 29th of july um, so uh, joining us today is a very eminent wildlife population ecologist dr james t nichols a little about dr nichols dr nichols is an animal population ecologist who has worked for over 40 years with the united states fish and wildlife service and the united states geological survey his research focused on the study of animal population dynamics and the use of what was learned to manage wildlife populations his work led to the research led to research on the development of quantitative methods for estimating parameters for animal populations and for making decisions in the face of uncertainty dr nichols awards include the wildlife society's aldo leopold award and the united states presidential rank award Dr. Nichols has had a 30-plus year collaboration with Dr. K. Ulas Karanth, uh, Emeritus Director of the Center for Wildlife Studies, India. Uh, Dr. Nichols has visited India on many occasions in the past to conduct research and to participate in workshops and to teach short courses on wildlife ecology and population estimation methods. Dr. Nichols, it's a pleasure having you with us today. Welcome and thank you for uh, agreeing to speak on this uh, uh, International Tiger Day webinar hosted by the Center for Wildlife Studies. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, uh, Vikram, and thanks to uh, Kriti and uh, Ulas Karant as well for the invitation to make this presentation today. It's a real honor and a pleasure for me, and uh, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I also want to be sure to thank Ulas. Uh, over the years, we've collaborated, as Vikram said, for a long time. And we've shared slides, and I'll, I've stolen many of his slides for uh, for this presentation today. Most of the interesting ones are his. And then finally, I want to especially thank uh, Ulas and all the members of the field teams that he has uh, created and led over the years that have provided the uh, the incredible data for the kinds of stuff I'll be talking about today. And they're obviously far too many people to than I can possibly mention, but I do want to single out one person, uh, uh, Samba Kumar, who was a leader of a lot of the field work that I'll talk about today um, for Ulas and Ulas's right-hand man, and once again, a, a longtime friend and colleague. Okay, if I could have the next slide, please. All right, so this one should say biological conservation at the top. And... Yes. What I would like to do today is obviously this, this, this presentation is going to be about tigers. Don't worry about that. But um, I would like to place this tiger work um, in India in a larger biological and conservation context. And that's what I'm trying to do here, because I think it provides a really nice example of the way that conservation should be working uh, all over the world, but, but isn't necessarily. Okay, so when I think of biological conservation, I think of humans that take actions to achieve objectives that we humans have set for biological systems that we're interested in. Now, the term biological system is very general, and by that, uh, uh, it can mean, a, a, say, a tiger population, it can mean the ecosystem associated with a particular protected area. It's a, a very general term, but something in the ecological biological world that we're interested in. And so our task then in order, if we're doing conservation, um, first involves making decisions. That is we have to decide what actions we can take are best for the system. And how do we define what's best? Well, we define it because we've set objectives. So what can we do to push systems towards the objectives that we have for them? If we're interested in increasing tiger numbers, if that's our objective, then what do we have to do? We have to figure out a smart ways, smart ways to try to achieve that. Um, but the problem that we often face is that with ecological and biological systems, we often don't know nearly as much as we would like to about the systems that we're interested in. We, we just don't know enough. Uh, and so what we're faced with is a prospect of trying to learn learn how, learn what, learn how our systems work and learn how they respond to the management actions that we can take. Now, science has proven over the centuries to be the sort of the best way that humans have of learning things. 
And so that's an approach that we would like to take usually when we're trying to understand biological systems. Okay, the next slide, please. So the next slide has to do with science and how it works. And I should first say that I think a lot of us think of science as sort of the stuff the, that lives on the pages of books that are entitled chemistry or biology or geology, something of that nature. In other words, a, a collection of facts or sort of provisional understandings about how these topics work. But when I think of science, I don't think of the sort of collection of our understanding, but I think of it as a process. In other words, it's a process by which we learn the things that end up in those books. So as a process, it starts with competing hypotheses or, or stories about how our system works. So I live in temperate North America. Um, I have a bird feeder out and I look at the bird feeder and some years I have fewer birds, it seems like, than others. And so I might have a hypothesis that really cold winters provide uh, sort of problems for, for my birds and maybe reduces survival rates so that I have fewer of them in the spring. So that's a, a hypothesis. It's just a story I generate about how bird populations that come to my feeder about how they work. Now, competing hypothesis is now nah, uh, cold winters may not be fun for birds, but they don't really increase mortality rates. So my job then as a scientist is to try to discriminate or try to tell which one of those hypotheses is the best descriptor of the reality of my backyard bird feeder. All right. So what we're going to do then is focus or what I would like to do is focus on situations for which these two hypotheses survival rate decreases or survival rate doesn't, for which they make different predictions. Um, sometimes I can do this experimentally, often with ecological systems, I can't do that. And so I have to do it observationally. And so my approach will be to collect observations. That is, I can put bands on birds and I can try to catch them over the years in order to use models that will allow me to estimate bird survival rates. And then I want to compare those survival rates for years that have particularly cold winters against other years. And basically that's a way then of testing and seeing whether my idea about cold winters reducing uh, survival is a, a good description or whether instead uh, cold winters don't lead to decreased survival rates. So just a real simple minded sort of a question, but an example of how um, I view science is working. Okay, the next slide, please. Now, I want to make one uh, point about science, and that is that these days, especially, it's increasingly difficult for one individual to be expert in all the disciplines that are required to actually conduct a scientific study. And so an example here is, say, you are a person who studies uh, tigers in India, and we're interested in those. Well, we have to, number one, we have to have people who are very good in the field, who are able to spend a lot of time looking at uh, tigers, probably not so much, but certainly tiger sign and gaining uh, whatever understanding they can about um, tigers from extensive field work and extensive biological knowledge. Um, also, though, we can think who else might such a person need in order to, in order to study tigers? Well, a couple of ways of studying them that have been uh, uh, used certainly in the past by, by my colleague uh, Ulas have been radio telemetry and camera trapping. Um, and with both of those disciplines, it's very likely we're going to have to have partners that know something about engineering. In other words, something about being able to design a radio collar and a, a way of receiving signals from the collar. Uh, we want to be able to design a camera trap that can withstand an elephant trying to crush it uh, and withstand monsoon, the wetness of monsoon seasons. And so uh, somebody with engineering expertise is certainly would be useful. Um, often, we may also need someone with statistical uh, abilities. That is someone who takes the raw data that I get in the, that the biologist gets in the field and then actually uses those data to estimate things that are useful for our um, for testing the predictions of our hypotheses. And then 
Also, we would often like a person with statistical or mathematical abilities to actually develop quantitative models allowing us to make predictions about the effects of our management actions on um, uh, biological populations. All right, so partnerships are often necessary, uh, are often useful. And in the early 1980s, uh, I did not know Ulas then, but he was a tiger biologist who had spent a lot of time studying tigers. Um, he had put radio collars on tigers, and he had spent a lot of effort studying tiger food habits. Um, this work led him to hypothesize that tiger population densities are actually determined by prey densities. That is, as prey densities go up, tiger population densities should go up. Now, a competing hypothesis was that obviously prey are, are essential for tigers. If you can't have prey, you can't have, have any tigers. But the prey densities were usually high enough to support variable densities of tigers and that other factors, uh, perhaps human poaching, but some kind of other factor was limiting tiger populations. So you had these two competing hypotheses. Ulas was very interested in distinguishing between those. Uh, and there are a number of predictions that those hypotheses make. And one prediction that he wanted, or way that he wanted to test this, was to ask whether locations with greater densities of prey um, also tend to be those locations that have greater densities of tigers. So that was one possible way of testing this idea of his. All right, if I could have the next slide. All right, this is uh, one of the critters then that we'll be uh, focusing on today. Now, the next slide. So in order to test this idea, one thing that Ulas needed was rigorous ways of estimating tiger and prey densities. Um, and it turns out that during in the late 80s, um, these methods didn't exist uh, in India or, or anywhere in, in Southeast Asia, really. Th there were methods of estimating things about tigers and their prey, but they weren't, it, we didn't have as much confidence in estimates as Ulas required for, for his rigorous tests. Now, in 1992, Ulas was visiting the University of Florida, his uh, former major professor, Mel Sunquist, also a, a tiger expert. Um, and I happened to be down there at the same time. I I'm, can't remember why. I think I was teaching a short course down there. But anyway, we arranged a meeting and we got together and talked about Ulas's hypotheses and about the estimation issues that he was very interested in. He obviously had extensive field expertise with tigers. Um, my expertise at that time was in estimation methods for animal populations. And so it was a, a natural sort of collaboration. That collaboration extended over uh, 30 years and I've made a, a number of trips to India to see exactly how the field sampling is going on. And, and obviously, Ulas has been to the States a number of times as well. OK, if I could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> so a brief history of tiger density estimation here. Uh, there was um, the so-called Pugmark census was used for a long time by the uh, India Department of Forestry. And it wasn't a, a silly idea at all. It was a pretty neat idea. The idea that maybe we can find footprints, pug marks of tigers, uh, develop, look at plaster casts of those, and then bring those casts to a biologist who is skilled in distinguishing and trying to tell one tiger from another uh, by these pug marks. And so large areas would be surveyed by uh, Indian foresters, the plaster casts of different individuals taken and then brought to someone who discriminated. And each time he got a uh, he or she got a uh, pug mark cast, they would say, does this belong to one of the individuals that I already have a cast for or instead is this a new guy? And so using that um, one sort of counted up the number of new individuals and that ended up being the estimate of tiger numbers for an area and so it uh it was it was a good idea but there were a couple of problems with it um one was matching uh, the idea that pug marks are the same tiger can appear differently on different substrates for example a tiger and one individual, if it left a pug mark in the mud, it might look a fair bit different from one it left in, say, the sand of a, a stream or river bottom. Um, and indeed, Ulas did some nice experimental work demonstrating that this was indeed true. Now, the other issue was detection. And that is, even if we did um, know 
could discriminate accurately all the different pug marks from a particular area. What we never know is what fraction of all the tigers in that area actually left pug marks that we were able to detect and then bring in and, uh, and, and look at. And so this issue of potential non-detection was one that also plagued the pug mark census. Okay, if I could have the next slide, please. All right, this is uh, one of Ulas's pictorial slides in this dilemma of being afraid to use pug mark work to get estimates that were that were reliable, that were actually required for Ulas's test, led to this evolution from the use of pug marks to uh, camera trapping. Uh, next slide, please. So. Ulas was certainly not the first person to use camera traps. Uh, photographers had used remotely uh, tripped cameras uh, for a number of years, trying to get nice pictures, nice photographs of uh, secretive animals, including tigers. And so use of camera traps was, was certainly not new. But what was new was this idea that one might be able to use such photographs uh, to actually estimate things and conduct science about um, tiger populations. Now, in retrospect, this seems like a real simple-minded, obvious kind of thing to do, but um, it turns out that most really clever ideas seem obvious once once somebody tells them what the, tells us what they are. And this was a, a, an extremely uh, clever idea, I thought. So the idea was with because tigers uh, sort of come already marked, they come with their individual stripe patterns, they're unique to individuals, one could use photographs then to discriminate among different individuals. And you could set a camera along a trail, for example, and um, cat and say get photographs of a number of tigers and maybe see the same individual multiple times. Now, the reason this was particularly useful is that wildlife biologists um, quite a long time before this, had developed what we often call capture-recapture models, which are pretty rigorous ways of estimating how many animals there are in an area and estimating animal densities. Now, the, the history of capture-recapture modeling is I might put an ear tag in a mouse, say, or a, a, a band or a ring on a bird's leg, and then so I would be doing the marking and then I would try to recapture these birds. And when I recaught one with one of my tags, I could mark down and I'd know who it was. And so this idea of using stripe patterns doesn't involve any kind of uh, physical capture at all, um, but it still uses the same kind of thinking that under, underlies the so-called capture recapture modeling. It was a way of dealing with non-detection. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a couple of photographs here of uh, Ulas and Samba here um, looking at camera traps. The one on the bottom right, um, you see that there are a couple of camera traps along this, uh, this, this trail or, or uh, dirt road. And the reason for that is that one has to know from a photograph whether it's an individual you've seen or not. Because tiger flanks have different uh, stripe patterns on the two flanks of an individual. You basically need both sides of the individual to actually determine uh, or, or know for sure who it is essentially, or at least initially. And then subsequent photographs, if you just get one flank or another, then, then you're fine. All right, next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to go through now uh, a number of slides that uh, are just sort of neat photographs that Ulas has made avail available to me, the kinds of things you can get from camera trapping. Okay, the next slide. I'm not sure how much of a lag time you need, but the next slide. The next slide. Okay, one more. Makes a point you can get young as well as old animals. The next slide, uh, and the next slide. And then finally, this next one, I believe, should be a bit different, okay? So now you should be on the slide that has uh, um, both a left flank and a right flank of the same individual, just making the point that these can be different, and that's the rationale for having two cameras at each one of your camera trap stations. Okay, next slide, please. Now, what's interesting is even a novice like me, someone who didn't know anything about tigers, could look at a photograph of a tiger flank 
And then I could compare that against a small number of known tiger photographs. And even I can tell the difference uh, and would be able to say, okay, this tiger is either a new individual, in other words, new in the sense that I don't have a photograph of it yet, or it's I can match it with an individual that there is a previous photograph of. But as you can imagine, as the number of tigers is the number of tigers in your photograph uh, library becomes larger and larger, this becomes a really difficult task. It, it's not so easy at all. And so <clears throat> Ulas collaborated with a colleague of his who was interested in biology, but also was a very good um, software and uh, image processing guy. Uh, next slide, please. And that colleague developed a piece of software uh, explicitly for, for Ulas's work that dealt with trying to look at stripe patterns on a tiger flank, trying to isolate portions of the flank, and then to use that to uh, help discriminate with a computer uh, and tell whether or not this uh, stripe pattern looked the, the similar or different to individuals already in a photographic library. So I'd have the next slide, please. This slide is just an example of a part of a tiger's flank. The idea is to model these things using wavelets, then to convert those to a binary image that can be compared to other, to the binary images of all the tigers that exist in your photographic library. Okay, next slide, please. So we should now be on a slide that has um, sort of a bunch of numbers. It's entitled Individual Detection, Non-Detection Data. So yes. when you, is that right? Yes, that's right, Dr. Nichols. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, I feel as though I ought to, um, yeah. If I'm going rapidly here, I ought to be sure we're, we're on the right page. So in this case, we have an ID and an identification, and these are just arbitrary numbers, 101, 102, 103. Those would be different tigers that result from camera trapping, from placing a number of camera traps in an area such as a, a, a protected area, such as Niagara Holy Park, for example. Um, these would be different individuals that are detected over a six week period that these cameras are out in the field. Um, we have weeks there, uh, one through six, and we can view each week as a sampling occasion. So each individual then has a row of ones and zeros associated with it. So if we look at individual 101, it has um, uh, number one for week one and a zero for week two. What that means is in week one, we detected this individual. That individual had a photograph of it taken. And in week two, there was, there was no photograph in that set of cameras for that individual. And so 101, for example, was ends up being caught or photographed on weeks one, three, four, and six of this uh, survey, of this set of sampling occasions, but not on periods two and five. And so every single individual that we get at least a single one for, that means we caught it at least once. And if we add those up, we end up with the, the, the number of individuals that were detected uh, in that area over uh, that, that six week period. And that gives us a minimum number of tigers that are there. But of course, that's not what we want. We want to know how many tigers were there, including ones that may not have uh, bothered to go buy one of our camera traps and get photographed. So what we have to do is try to estimate how many rows of all zeros there are, all zeros meaning individuals that were never ever detected. And I won't go into the details of that, but I can give you a, a hint about the intuition that underlies that um, trying to estimate all the zeros. And that is look at, look at um, tiger number 101. Um, we know that it was caught in week one, and we know that it was it was detected in week six. So what does that mean? That means there were four periods, two, three, four, and five, when we know the animal was around, we know it's there. And what we're trying to do is estimate and say, given that the animal's there, what's the probability that we detect it on any one of our occasions? So if we look at weeks two through five, it was detected on two of those weeks, three and four. It wasn't detected on two and five. And so two divided by four weeks, on two of those weeks, we actually detected the animal. So we would say in terms of the information provided by, by this animal 101, uh, this way of looking at it, 
there's about a 50% chance that we'd catch the animal on a particular day, conditioning on times when we know it's available because we saw it before and we saw it after. So anyway, that ability then to look at these strings of ones and zeros and to estimate the likelihood that an animal is caught given that it's around, that allows us then to estimate how many all zeros there were, the number of guys that were around, and we just missed them every single time. Okay, the next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> so capture recapture data like this are often divided into things called closed models and open models. I won't say much about this, just that closed models are over relatively short periods of time when you can hopefully assume that there's not many animals dying or coming into the population over that period. Uh, our six week period, maybe a four to six week sampling period would be like that. Uh, and we would use, we would, we would call these things closed population models and use them for density or abundance estimation. Um, there are also models that can be used for capture occasions that have much longer intervals between them. And, and with those models, we're able to estimate things like survival rates, recruitment rates, and population growth rates. Um, again, with capture occasions being so far apart that we realize that the population is changing between them. Um, but for this particular um, exercise, this idea of estimating tiger prey densities, we use these so-called closed models. Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, here's a, a slide. The, uh, the inset there has, I believe this is Carnotic Estate uh, in the yellow, and then the area in light and dark green then represents uh, particular areas where one could actually find, uh, find tigers, a tiger landscape with the dark green uh, indicating protected areas. And down at the bottom left is, uh, is Niagara Holy Park, which, uh, next slide please. Um, this is a sort of a close-up of Nagar Holy, and it's got a couple of things on it. It's basically a uh, figure that represents tiger density patterns within uh, Nagar Holy Park. Now, the dots that you see represent different camera traps, that is, camera trap locations throughout the park. And we can say that these were ongoing for a four or six week period, say. And then the shadings represent the tiger densities as estimated using this capture recapture modeling. And the darker areas here represent the higher um, densities of, of animals. And so with something like this, one can estimate either local densities as we've done here or densities for the entire park where a density say is the number of tigers per hundred square kilometers within this particular area. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time talking and all this time so far, we haven't gotten to, to testing the losses hypothesis, but we've just been focusing on how in the world do you estimate densities for a secretive animal like the tiger. Uh, but we also have to think about prey densities, right? Because the hypothesis involved those as well. <clears throat> and now camera trapping is not gonna be so useful for um, tiger prey species, for many tiger prey species, because they can't be, um, you can't discriminate individuals based on coat patterns or, or pelage patterns, if you will. Um, so that's, that's sort of bad news. We probably can't use something like camera trapping for most of the species. Um, but the good news is that most of the important prey species are more easily detected than tigers. They, occur at much higher densities. We see a lot more of them and they can be detected during the day as well. Uh, next slide, please. And so at the time Ulas was developing this work, in fact, way before he met me, he recognized that probably a good way to, uh, to estimate tiger density, or excuse me, prey densities might be something called distance sampling. It was another approach that wildlife biologists had developed this time for species that can be easily detected as you um, walk along, say, and you can actually see animals. The um, usual approach to this distance sampling uh, developed during the, primarily during the 80s and, and then available then during the 90s, uh, but never having been used in India before, the way to do this was to detect animals while you're walking along a line transects. That's one of the methods of doing this. You then measure the right angle distance 
from when you detect an animal from the transect where you're standing to the actual detected animal. And of course, you're usually detecting animals way before you come along and, and can actually measure the right angle distance directly. And so you actually have to use a compass and a range finder to compute these distances. But, but the point is the key element is the animal that you detected and how far away it is from the line that you're walking from you. And so why is that a big deal? Well, the estimation of how many you miss, once again, when you get done with this, you're gonna end up with a number of animals that you've detected and the job or the task is to estimate how many of them you missed. And the key to estimating how many you missed is the animals farther away from the line are less likely to be detected, to be detected than animals closer to the line. And so can, you can use this fact coupled with the fact that if you actually bump into an animal right on the line, you're almost gonna be certain to detect it. You can use these two facts to estimate the probability of detecting animals at any given distance from the line to estimate what that drop off in detection probability looks like. And that allows you to estimate how many animals are missed along the transect. You add that number missed to the number you detected and you have an estimate of the total number that's there. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, these are just four of the species, for example, in the, um, in the the southern western ghats that Ulas was especially interested in is prey species, uh, um, cheetah, sambar, uh, gaur, and muntjac. Next slide, please. This is an example of uh, uh, blind transects, basically walking um, uh, multiple kilometers in the woods, in the forest, um, keeping your eyes open for animals, and then taking these measurements each time you saw an animal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just making the point here, you see a group of cheetah and grouped animals present no problems. There's a way of dealing with those just as there is of dealing with the individual sightings. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the kind of thing you can, uh, you can produce from such line transect or distance sampling data. Uh, these are the two protected areas, Nagarholi and Bandapur, once again presenting one of these density maps, in this case for cheetah. Uh, and the darker areas represent the higher densities of cheetah. So once again, we can estimate uh, density gradients within a, a reserve or protected area, as well as densities that correspond to the entire parks themselves. All right, next slide, please. All right, so now that we have, we spent a lot of time talking about this, but now that we have rigorous ways of estimating both prey and tiger densities, we can then begin to address Ulas's uh, question. Um, and next slide, please. And so we can test and ask whether tiger densities um, at different locations will be positively, positively related to prey species densities in a specific way. When I said in a specific way, I, I should mention that Ulas didn't just predict that, okay, when tiger uh, prey numbers are higher, we should have higher tiger numbers as well. But his food habit studies, um, providing him with information on about how many uh, individual prey species a tiger needs to eat in a year, actually allowed him to make a very specific prediction about that what that relationship ought to look like. Um, again, we had the competing hypotheses was that prey didn't matter very much. And Ulas's field teams then estimated tiger and prey densities across 11 protected areas throughout India over very different ecological settings and situations uh, from the north to the south uh, over an eight year period. So this was enormous um, study covering a very large amount of land. And uh, for ecology, this, this kind of study was uh, very much, um, anyway, it was, it was unique. It's not the kind of thing that was done anywhere else in the world. It was very impressive. All right, the next slide then provides sort of the, the take home message in terms of the results, if you will, of this work. And it's gonna take me a minute to explain it here. So you should have a, a figure on your slide that has a number of different colors on it and lines and stuff. And I'm gonna just focus on what I think are the, the key elements. Now, now first I'll show you a mistake I made and it's my, my mistake, I apologize. If you look on the left-hand side, you'll 
the tiger densities in animals per 100 square kilometers. Um, and you'll see that I've got the numbers going up. They go 5, 15, 15, 20. Well, that first 15 should be a 10. I apologize for that. Um, yeah, it should just be going up from, from 0 to 25 in uh, five-unit increments. All right, the, the so-called x-axis, the, the line along the bottom there goes from, uh, from 0 to 70, and that reflects prey density. That is density of these key prey species that we lost new were taken by tigers because it was food habit study um, measured in animals per, per, per kilometer squared. Now, the middle, you see three lines um, sort of in the middle of those figures. Now, the middle of, of those lines, the middle one, was Ulas's very specific prediction about what the relationship should be between prey and tiger density. Now, the numbers, or excuse me, the lines on the two sides of that represent what's often called a prediction interval, a 75% prediction inter interval, which means that none of our predictions are ever made without error. We always have variances associated with them. And these are sort of the, the range, the levels of uncertainty, reflect the levels of uncertainty, the width of, of, uh, of those, those lines, how far they are apart in the prediction. So the predictions become more uncertain as we go out through time. Now, the key things to look at here are the solid dots. Those solid dots, each solid dot represents the estimate of tiger density and prey density for one of these 11 areas throughout, uh, throughout India. And then the ellipse or the circle around that represents the confidence associated with that density. And so by, when, I, when I talk about the densities, let's look at Pana as an example. Um, protected area, it's the purple uh, or sort of violet in sort of right in the center of this with a, a purple dot that's just a little bit under Ulas's predictive line there. Now that purple dot, if we follow that over to the tiger density in, uh, axis, we see that it's about maybe seven um, tigers per 100 kilometers squared. That's the, that was the estimate then that Ulas's team obtained for Pana protected area. Then if we go down, if we look straight down at prey density, we see it's maybe 31 uh, anim, uh, prey animals per square kilometer in that area. So those reflect the estimates from his work and the circles and ellipses reflect the confidence in them. Now, when I look at this as a biologist, I think there's there's some other stuff in here that I'm happy to talk about after this, but um, those are the main points to focus on. And when I look at this as a biologist, I'm, uh, I'm pretty darn happy. I say this is really good agreement of uh, these dots with this line, this Ulas' prediction. Now, if you're a physicist or an engineer, you may say, wow, this looks terrible. Look at all the variation there. But for biological work, especially with biological populations, trust me, this is really, really good. It's, uh, it was an exceptionally good fit. Um, I should mention that this, this figure actually comes from a paper that the work was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, which is a, a very, very uh, prestigious journal and a, a nice place to have this come out. But basically, it provided then um, strong support. It didn't prove it, but it provided strong support for Ulas's initial prediction, which is what, well, what we were interested in, is whether there was support for the prediction or not. Okay, can I see the next slide, please? <clears throat> now, an issue with observational studies as opposed to experimental studies is that we're almost never, they are almost never definitive. In other words, we can't look at this and say, wow, we got such a good relationship that I'll regard that as something that's absolute truth. And it's a fact, and I, I, now we know it. Instead, we review, or I view this anyway, as a provisional understanding that that's a, this uh, Ulas's uh, hypothesis was absolutely supported. And so it, when I go forward, I'm going to tend to think of that as the way the tiger populations work and respond to densities. But I'm going to recognize that additional work on this topic would be, uh, would be useful as well. Um, repeat testing is almost always important uh, for observational work. Uh, Ulas understood this, of course, and so he wanted to test a different prediction of his hypothesis, but he wanted to do so at a landscape scale. 
So instead of looking at 11 local areas, local protected areas throughout India, he wanted to look at the entire landscape of uh, this uh, Malanad Mysore tiger landscape in the Western Ghats and ask a different sort of question, a ask a similar question, I guess, but a different prediction. And he wanted, he, he predicted that tiger occupancy, that is the likelihood that you'd find tigers in a part of that landscape, was positively related to the relative prey density that you would find in that landscape. <clears throat> so a very similar kind of prediction to the one that made earlier, but it differed in a couple of key ways. Um, the one thing that was, was absolutely sure is that you couldn't use camera trapping and distance sampling uh, to do this. You'd need the budget of the U.S. Defense Department or something to be able to do that. There's just no way um, this, this would be possible, far too labor intensive. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we did was develop an occupancy modeling approach, which is an approach to estimating the probability that a species is going to be in an area or the proportion of an area that's occupied by a species, estimating that while dealing with non-detection and using, uh, it's an approach that actually can use animal sign. So what we're doing now is using uh, detection, non-detection data. But now, instead of being able to see an individual animal or not, as we did with camera trapping, we're looking at chunks of land, that is, is spatial sample units. And on each one of those sample units, we're asked, we conduct some sort of survey. We walk a couple kilometers of game trails, say, and what we're trying to do is look for tiger sign, that is, a pug mark, scat, scrape, or whatever. Um, and using those data, to then estimate the likelihood that given that an area is occupied by tigers, what's the probability that we'll actually detect sign of it there? And once again, we have a bunch of areas where we actually do detect sign, where we know animals are there, and then estimate the probability that other areas where we don't detect sign, estimate the likelihood that they actually are occupied still by tigers. Um, for prey density, um, um, the uh, ULAS ended up using indices that are basically based on sign and counter race, like how many tracks of ungulate prey species for how many individuals, how many tracks per square kilometer of a game trail, say, do we see, uh, or how many um, dung of how many different individuals do we see, that kind of thing. And so very different data collection, but it was designed because this kind of data collection was uh, able to be conducted over a very large spatial scale um, that would be impossible to do the, uh, for which it would be impossible to do the camera trapping and the distance sampling. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Just a couple of slides here to indicate the uh, sort of the field nature of science surveys for both tigers. Next slide. Uh, and prey species as well. Okay, next slide. So, <clears throat> this should be a slide without a photograph, um, and it should uh, uh, basically be saying that a survey then was implemented by ULAS's teams in 2006-2007 in this particular landscape in the Western Ghats, and it was an enormous survey effort. It involved 15 months, uh, as you can see, a lot of person days, a lot of kilometers being walked along trails, and detection of, in this case, a, a lot of tiger sign, individual tiger sign as well. Next slide, please. Once again, just illustrating the area uh, the, where this was, uh, where this work was done in Karnataka State, in the green and light, the dark and light green area, formed the the majority of this uh, formed this this Malanad Mysore landscape. Next slide, please. This, the figure on the right there can be is kind of analogous to those density figures we showed earlier, except instead of density now, it actually has uh, estimates of tiger occupancy. So if we look at the scale, we look at the dark green squares, these are spatial cells within the area where tiger occupancy is very high. In this case, there's a 77 to 90 percent likelihood that tigers uh, are present in those areas. And then they go down to areas in the um, brown, for example, 
where the likelihood of tigers being present is substantially lower. There, there's still uh, a non-negligible chance that tigers will be there. It's just less of, of that landscape is going to be occupied than of the dark green. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. All right, so we conducted then, we, uh, from using the data from that very large scale study, we conducted an occupancy analysis. And the main results are listed down below. Basically, tiger occupancy is substantial, was substantially higher in areas of higher prey density. Now with this landscape study, Dulas, Ulas added some other hypotheses to his list of things to test as well. Uh, and they came out also. It turned out that tiger occupancy was greater in tiger in forest habitat, which tiger hit, which uh, Ulas had predicted, and it was lower in areas of human with with higher human and livestock density as predicted as well. So these are just extra hypotheses that dealt with that were able to be uh, tested, extra predictions uh, from this large landscape level study. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so I have three summary slides here, and then I'll. Um, be quiet and we can open it up to discussion. Uh, the first is sort of a summary. Basically this work, first the initial work at the 11 protected areas across India uh, and then at the landscape scale, both provide strong evidence of this predicted relationship between tiger densities and prey densities, again at two different spatial scales. And so once again, this is not necessarily proven, but absolutely um, this is uh, this is the, what most of us believe now. How tigers that tigers are absolutely responsive to uh, to prey densities in the way that Ulas has predicted. I should point out that there are interesting byproducts for this work that um, I, I wanted to note, um, and that is this work was done in India. It was done explicitly for tigers and their prey, and yet these methods have now been borrowed and used all over the world for other species as well. And I'm just focusing on two methods here. There are actually some other methods associated with genetic work and, and other things that have been borrowed also. But for camera trap capture recapture, for example, this idea including the, the models, the modification of capture recapture models of photo ID software, these things are now widely used for studying carnivore populations worldwide. Uh, they're used for jaguars in Central and South America, uh, and they're used for just, just uh, a variety of species. So despite the fact that it was developed with specific purposes, it's been borrowed and has made a big impact on the study of animal populations in general. Um, occupancy modeling similarly was developed just because we were trying to think of how to deal, how to deal with um, um, tiger presence and absence at a large landscape scale, but it turned out that that idea, once again, is one that has been pervasive and has become of interest to animal and, and plant ecologists um, worldwide. And indeed, now it's tough to pick up a journal that deals with ecology, any sort of uh, animal or plant ecology that doesn't have examples of this occupancy modeling in it. And sometimes you can find as many of the, as a quarter to a, a third of the issues of, excuse me, of the papers in a particular journal issue will actually contain occupancy modeling. So once again, it's a, a product developed with specific purposes, in this, this case for India and tigers, um, but it's being used worldwide. Okay, but the central product, of course, the aim of this entire endeavor was what we talked about in the very first slide, was trying to do biological conservation. That is, was trying to learn something about tiger populations that would allow folks to con, uh, to um, enact actions, that is to take actions to bring about increases in tiger numbers, that is to support objectives. Next slide, please. So the uh, clear message from this work of Ulas is that if somehow um, we're able to build up prey base, then tigers will respond to that and tiger pop tiger numbers will go up as well. And that this is uh, an important way, if we can figure out some way to, uh, some ways to increase tiger prey bases. Um, so conservation actions targeting prey and predators, and excuse me, prey and tigers, we can think of a number of ways to do that. Two that Ulas and his groups have focused on over the years, have been the, the obvious one of increased um, 
um, legal protection. That is increased patrolling of parks and protected areas by rangers, uh, increased law enforcement. Another sort of unique and, and really interesting sort of approach is this voluntary resettlement of, in, of villages within parks. Sometimes you have villages or in holdings of indigenous folks um, actually within these parks. Um, these peoples, of course, are making a living with subsistence agriculture and probably supplementing that by, by poaching some of the prey species. And Nulas's idea was to try to go ahead and somehow get the funding to obtain uh, better housing for, for these people and access to, 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 act, to better jobs outside of the park and then trying to um, encourage resettlement as a way of both making people's lives better and simultaneously, hopefully reducing poaching pressure on the prey species of tigers. And this has been, a, a it looks to have been a, a very, an extremely effective way to, uh, to, to do things, uh, to, that is to encourage um, and protect prey species. All right, finally, the, the last slide here, the, the next one. So um, in the brief summary sort of here about sort of science, um, using science to inform conservation for tigers uh, in India. I believe that ULAS's program actually provides, and, and this is just a piece of it, it's not his entire program at all, but this program provides a really good example for biological conservation worldwide. Now, uh, across the world, there's been an increasing cries uh, by conservation biologists for so-called evidence-based conservation. And what that means is that very often we, we will have hypotheses about what actions we can take to bring about um, the objectives that we would like to have for, for ecological systems. That is the things that we can do to help make things, uh, uh, make things better for animal populations say. So we have hypotheses about these, uh, but very frequently they're not based on evidence. They're, they're based on logic and often they make sense but there have been a number of glaring examples where people have had hypotheses about how to uh, to improve, say, uh, uh, a particular population, how to in, uh, do something that increases population size of a particular threatened species, and how these efforts have not been useful at all uh, because our hypothesis turned out to be incorrect, uh, turned out to not be a good description of how things work. And so the idea of having these hypotheses is actually absolutely fine and even working on them in a preliminary way um, using them to create actions is okay but simultaneously at least we should be trying to learn that is we should be trying to learn about their efficacy how likely are these hypotheses to be true and what we would like to do is base conservation on evidence on scientific evidence which is what ULAS's program has uh, has been all about um, use of science then to test key hypotheses and to learn about how populations work and respond to management actions was sort of a key to this program. And I think continued work, <clears throat> it's important in the continued work, focus on the, <clears throat> the implementation of these actions that are suggested and then the direct study of tiger responses to them. In other words, this moves our studies from sort of a more observational approach to a more experimental approach. If we can actually look at tiger and prey populations um, in say particular areas, implement an action and then look and observe their responses to those actions. It provides additional support presumably for the hypotheses and even stronger evidence then of the the kinds of actions that we should be taking. And in my view, this is a, this a again, a nice way forward, a sensible way forward uh, for tigers and their prey in India. And it's a sensible way forward and something that the world should be looking at as a way of doing biological conservation in general. So thanks very much. I'm not sure I haven't been paying enough attention to time. I hope I, I didn't go over and and left enough for uh, for questions here. So I'll, I'll I'll, I'll turn things back. Thank you very much, Dr. Nichols. Uh, it's a very nice presentation. And of course, I've referred to a lot of your research and Dr. Karan's research as well. During my own PhD work, 
and then my subsequent work on uh, um, on wildlife populations across India, but particularly in the Eastern Ghats. So thank you very much. Um, the participants, if you have any questions for Dr. Nichols, uh, please feel free to message in the chat box below, and I'll I'll read out your questions to Dr. Nichols. <clears throat> so Dr. Nichols, I had a couple of questions myself, and if you'd allow me, I'd, I I'd like to go first. Uh, so you talked about uh, prey, uh, the methods for pre estimating prey densities, the distance sampling methods. Uh, so how much of an influence do you think uh, vegetation density and forest cover as on, uh, you know, detecting or our ability to detect uh, prey, uh, prey densities? Because I've noticed that in your slide, in your graph, where you showed uh, <clears throat> your densities as a function of prey density, uh, many of the parks on the right side of the graph, uh, particularly uh, Ranthambor and Kaziranga, uh, these are uh, relatively these uh, parks have more open vegetation. Kaziranga is more of a wetland, uh, uh, a wetland forest matrix, and Ranthambor is more slightly uh, dry deciduous forest type. So, how, how, what can do you think this is a very strong influence on uh, our ability to, to detect prey? the vegetation type? Uh, yes, I think it does as well. Uh, I think it very much does. Uh, again, somebody like Ulas or Samba would be better able to answer this, but um, so I'll say a couple of things. The one thing that happens when you have increased vegetation and more difficulty in seeing animals, uh, especially ones that are distant from your line, the one thing you expect is the drop off in density with, excuse me, drop off in detection probability um, with distance to increase. In other words, it should be a very steep drop off. And what this does is lead to lower detection probabilities overall, which lead to bigger variances, or the way to say it is more uncertainty associated with your density estimates. So the good news is that you can still get density estimates even in cases where um, such um, where detection drops off because of visibility issues associated with vegetation, but the good news is that you're the, the, that you're not yeah you're not fooled. In other words, you can still get estimates. You just have less confidence in them. And I will say that the um, when you're performing these analyses of, uh, of getting density estimates, as, as you know, but some of the uh, people in the audience might not, you're actually doing this for each specific location. And so what that means is that I've got a different, when Ulas went out and did this work, he has a different location for a place like Ranthambur, for example, excuse me, a different detection probability for a place like Ranthambur than he would for a place like Niger Holy, for example. Uh, and so you get a detection probability that's specific to the place where you're doing the surveying um, in order to make sure that the sort of estimates you get indeed correspond to that area and are not just sort of ballpark area uh, estimates that correspond to the entire country. But in addition to that, you can even imagine situations where the vegetation is so dense that what that might do is say that uh, is remove distance sampling as a method to even estimate prey densities. And so in other words, there's certain places where even that may be true. And then the animal ecologist and the statistician have to get together and think about perhaps alternative methods for estimating animal numbers in cases where literally visibility goes to zero so quickly that you can't do anything. I don't think that was the case in any, well, I know it wasn't in any of these 11 areas, but you can imagine certain situations where that might happen. D does that address your question? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Yes. thank you. So I'm going to read out an audience, audience question now. Uh, Mr. Rajkumar says, uh, what is your view on the efficacy of the field of dreams approach? in the context of the program for the introduction of African cheetahs in India. Okay, um, so I don't, I'm not knowledgeable enough to say an awful lot, but I, I have a couple of comments on that. So the field of dreams approach is, is, is kind of important because it's important, to, I think, to the notion of re reintroduction. 
Uh, mm. So one of the failures I think we've had in the past, a lot of the time with animal reintroductions, is we tend to try to put animals in, in places where they were historically, but we've done so without trying to remedy the problems that cause them to move away or die off from those places to begin with. So you know, the whole notion of reintroductions requires that we pay a lot of attention to trying to fix in a way, the things that were wrong and caused the individuals to be absent from those places initially. And so uh, I guess what I can't can't speak to details of what would, would and would not be useful, but what I can say is that an awful lot of attention ought to be going to the kinds of things that make a landscape suitable for cheetah uh, and trying to make sure that such a landscape um, exists because in the absence of, uh, uh, again, sort of the natural requirements for any predator species, you can reintroduce all you want and they're not gonna necessarily take hold and, and thrive there as you would like, right? So I had another question for you. Um, what do you think is the, are the chances of successfully uh, using the photo capture recapture uh, methods like like you've used for tiger uh, for estimating tiger numbers do you think we can use these for estimating the numbers of species like pangolins for example because pangolins are i mean uh, uh, the scales may not be you, can, you may not be able to individually identify pangolins right. uh, from the photos but they are very they're extremely rare and they are becoming even more rare because of hunting and illegal wildlife trade uh, so the chances of seeing two pangolins in the same area is almost negligible they're extremely rare because I've tried camera trap methods for detecting pangolins myself. And we only got about one or two images of pangolins. So uh, do you think uh, we, this method can somehow, some, somehow be modified to estimate uh, individual numbers of pangolins? Okay, so I'll have a couple of responses. And I guess the one I'm most uncertain about is the degree to which you can think Okay, if I'm at a particular area, I have one camera trap station and I get um, two or three pangolin photographs, I'm not, com I don't know enough to be able to say, yeah, there's a real high likelihood it's the same individual. So I, I don't know how to use that information. But yes, I'm, so I'm working with a fellow named Charles Imagor, who you may know, I don't know, in, uh, in yeah. Africa on his pangolin work. And so there are two things that come to mind. In there, we have focused primarily on occupancy modeling. And that was, so here, we don't rely on the ability to identify individuals, but what we do is try to say, okay, um, here are areas that uh, have high, here are areas that have a high proportion of occupancy, a high likelihood pangolins are there. And then ask, in, his, in Charles' particular case, he's asking, um, whether these air, basically whether human habitation um, is a distance to human habitation and roads is associated with pangolin occupancy. In other words, am I a lot more likely to find pangolins in areas away from settlements and roads than I am on ways, uh, on places that are, that are very near settlements and roads. So occupancy landscape kinds of questions can be asked using camera traps for sure. Now, the other thing that's possible is something that uh, ULAS has done for tigers, it, and it's not as good as some of the other ways of estimating population size, but you can use the model, the so-called Royal Nichols model, uh, a way of using presence-absence data to try to estimate actual numbers of animals. And so there, there is a way just based on presence-absence data of trying to estimate how many animals are, are in an area. Uh, and it's, uh, it's possible that something like that, if nothing else is, is possible, that that might be useful to you. And it basically relies on the idea that you're much, um, yeah, if you, have, um, if you have a place where you have lots and lots of detections, it's likely because there are more than one animal there. In other words, there, there are multiple animals. And so it, it base, is based on the, increase in detection probability at the landscape scale that's accompanied by increases in population size. Right, right. Thank you.
Sure. I can take another question from the audience now. Um, sorry. So Mr. Mohan says, in addition to the direct effect, anthropogenic disturbance can also indirectly influence tiger occupancy by negatively influencing the activity and sorry, the activity and distribution of their primary prey species. However, a conundrum arises in areas that witness a human shield effect on prey. How do we tease apart the effect of human disturbance on tigers in such cases, especially in diffuse edges around protected areas? Okay, so the question has to do with the influence of humans on tigers, human influence, or? Yes. <clears throat> He's talking about areas that witness a human shield effect on prey. I'm not sure exactly what this means, but then he says, how do we tease apart the effect of human disturbance on tigers in such cases, especially in diffuse edges around protected areas? Yeah. I think he's, he's talking about um, the effect of human, human, human activity and human disturbance on tigers around the uh, edges of protected areas. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm having a little trouble thinking about exactly what scenario um, he's envisioning is causing problems. So, so maybe, so, so one idea, and you, you can tell me if this sounds like, sounds right. So one idea is around edges of protected areas, you have human settlement. And so perhaps tigers, uh, if there is a, a relationship as there was found in, in Ulas's landscape study, um, then you wouldn't find tiger densities that were as high near human settlements as you would um, uh, away from human settlement. And so uh, maybe the idea is that, <clears throat> yeah, maybe the idea is that prey species, you could be misled about the effects of prey species because tigers were not in an area for a reason that did not have anything to do with prey. Maybe that was it. Um, so, so I'll have a couple of comments about that. One of the comments is that often when, or at least some of the stuff I've looked at at protected areas, both in Asia and in uh, Africa, is that often prey species are actually affected negatively by human disturbance also. And those, <laughs> so, yeah. But the other thing I'll mention though, is if you believe that to be an issue, then the natural thing to do is incorporate that as an additional explanatory variable or covariate in your model. So in other words, in the landscape study, this is exactly what was done in the occupancy work. In other words, the occupancy work didn't just have a simple model that said tiger density, uh, excuse me, tiger occupancy is a function of prey density. But it said that tiger occupancy is a function of multiple things, of prey density, of distance to human settlement, um, and of forested area as well. And so you have all three of those things in your model. So it wasn't as simple a model as the one I showed of tiger density and uh, prey density. It was one that incorporated some other things. So we'd have to have multiple dimensions to, uh, to build a graph of it. But that, that's the way I think you would do it. And so if you viewed distance to human settlement as an important um, element of this of determin or determinant of tiger density, then one would incorporate that into ULAS's model as a way of asking whether that was needed to make it even a better predictor. Or at least that's, that's the way I would tend to think of it. And indeed, one, could, one has that information um, um, in turn, I mean, you could look at different densities of people, uh, say, around the different parks and ask whether or not this was uh, important in, in that relationship that we showed. So I'm sorry, I didn't give a very clear answer, but, but I think there are ways forward. And the way forward is basically, if you think, if you have another predictor, another thing that you think is an important determinant of something like tiger occupancy or density, then absolutely you want want to measure that and try to incorporate that in your modeling effort. Right. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'll take another question now. So, Shri, uh, climate change is deemed to be one of the most immediate threats to human well-being. Do you think tiger conservation can be linked to climate change 
in order to cre create wider understanding of its importance. <clears throat> so the question is, uh, how do you think we can link tiger conservation and climate change? Right. Okay, so the key ways to, to, so the key issue of climate change, if we want to incorporate that into our conservation thinking, is to make predictions about what climate change is going to do to the key things that affect tigers, right? In other words, we, we need to make some guesses, some predictions about how climate change is going to uh, affect the key determinants of tiger density. Um, and so what I can do is tell you, that just, just because I'm not as knowledgeable as I should be uh, about climate change and tigers, can I give you a, a different example from a different species that presents an example of how I think such things can be can be done. Okay, so in North America, we have mallard ducks and mallard ducks make lots more babies when there are lots of wetlands uh, in these northern breeding areas where they have. When, when things are dry during breeding areas, excuse me, dry in the breeding areas, they make many fewer babies. Their reproductive rate goes way down. And so when I think, when we think now of how to deal with climate change in mallards, what we end up doing is saying that, okay, now, instead of just measuring sort of the wetland status, in other words, what we do is hang out of airplanes and count ponds uh, over vast areas of Canada and uh, Northern United States. And when we, instead of just counting these ponds and saying, this is what we have this year, if we're thinking about climate change, what we wanna do is now model not only our mallard populations themselves, uh, but we want to incorporate into our modeling what we think is going to happen to pond numbers. And so now we just bring, if you will, another variable into our modeling effort, which is a variable that we think is important to mallards, number one, and is one that we really expect to be affected by climate change, number two. And so the key, bringing it back to tigers, would be to think about the ways in which climate change is most likely to affect things, uh, variables that affect tigers, and to then bring those changes, bring that those variables and the predicted changes into your modeling effort. So it makes the modeling sort of the way you think about making predictions more complicated because you've got to consider not just changes in tigers, but changes in things that bring about changes in tigers. Um, but that's the kind of thinking, I believe, that goes into trying to deal with climate change when we're trying to do biological conservation. Uh, There's a final question. Um, I think we can end the questions after this. How do you validate the prediction of occupancy methods in a given area to be sure about the methods, to be sure about the, uh, the prediction of the occupancy models? Okay, that's a difficult one um, to be sure of a particular method that estimates probabilities of non-detection. Um, so what pe I, um, seeing here trying to think. So, so one thing people do, um, and we've done a lot of this with occupancy modeling, is spend a lot of time simulating different kinds of situations where you know what truth is because you simulated it on a computer and then can ask how well does my occupancy model um, end up, how well does it perform in terms of giving me estimates that I can believe. Now, I, well, maybe not obviously, but when assumptions of, of occupancy modeling are well met, it, we, we know it performs perfectly. It does very, very well. <clears throat> but then we can ask questions and say, okay, well, what if this one assumption um, of occupancy modeling doesn't work well. So uh, then what we can do is ask how well the models perform. And so if there's a specific problem in mind, we can investigate it by simulation. Now, in terms of um, knowing, knowing truth, um, with occupancy, it's more difficult. With capture recapture, for example, and with distance sampling, people have actually gone to the exercise of having, say, um, uh, in some cases, they're large enclosures, for example, where you can have uh, 
the example I'm thinking of has to do with mule deer in Colorado. Where there's an extremely large enclosure. People knew how many deer were there. And what you could do is use capture recapture methods um, or distance sampling methods to estimate numbers there. And that's one of the rare cases where you know truth. Um, and so, so I guess the, the, it's difficult to know truth in a landscape scale kind of study. Um, and the best I can say is what you want to do is test the assumptions underlying occupancy modeling individually. Um, and you become wary or nervous or lose confidence when some of those assumptions are, are not, are not even being close to being met. In other words, if you have real problems with some assumptions, maybe you have to think of another way to, uh, to do things. Right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. I think we can conclude the session. It's been about an hour and a half. So uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining us on the special International Tiger Day webinar with uh, Dr. James Nichols on uh, estimating methods for estimating the populations of wildlife uh, across the world. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Nichols, uh, for your very interesting presentation. I know I've learned a lot uh, I've also referred to your papers a lot of times in the past. It was very, very fascinating for me to hear from you again. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a good day. Well, thank you. And thank you, Vikram. And thank you for all the, the people who bothered to, to listen to this. I very much appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.